Yes, welcome everybody. My name is uh, Wolfgang Ungra. On behalf of the uh, board of the MIT Club of Germany, I would like to uh, extend a very warm welcome to everyone who's taken the time on a Friday evening to uh, attend this uh, panel discussion and uh, the presentations which will precede them. Um, it's a great it's a great honor to have so many uh, great speakers, distinguished distinguished speakers, as well as uh, fiery entrepreneurs, um, and who will be sharing with us the next one and a half hours. Um, thanks very much uh, to Peter, who's been uh, coordinating and putting this together. Thank you, Peter, for uh, the presentation. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I would like to just start off before I hand over to say a few things uh, to those people who don't know the MIT Club of Germany yet. Uh, we are a volunteer organization. Uh, our main purpose is to bring all the alums and friends uh, together in Germany, but also, of course, create a network of intellectual exchange, professional exchange, social exchange. We have about 700 uh, uh, alumni here in Germany, uh, and of, of those, about 200 are full members, we say active members. Um, we have a vision, we have a mission. Uh, our mission is essentially to engage people uh, and to contribute uh, to our vision, which is uh, doing whatever we can to create some impact into a better world. And one of those is clearly since quite uh, almost two years now, um, environmental and sustainability topics. And in this uh, context, of course, we have today's event um, on uh, the topic of smart circular cities and people who do something about it. So for us, this is very important. Um, today, we will. Uh, I will hand over uh, to Sarah, who will be saying something about uh, the MIT Alumni Energy Environment and Sustainability Network, which is a global network. Um, especially uh, concentrated on, of course, sustainability topics. Uh, Peter will then take over um, to say something about today's event, but also how it fits into our overall um, event series and the uh, Smart Circular Cities series. Um, and then we will have uh, Philip uh, Gerbert, who's uh, highly proficient uh, in Munich uh, at the uh, TUM, and uh, obviously he will be introduced properly, uh, take us through the rest of the day with a panel discussion. So we hope to finish by about 6.30 uh, European time. Uh, we hope everyone uh, will be able to also contribute. Um, and we have uh, the ability to place your questions. You will not be able to do that directly through your microphone, but if you please um, post your questions in the Q&A section, not in the chat, section in the Q&A section. Um, and then we will take maybe not all questions, but we will take some of the questions and bring them into the panel so that they can be discussed. So um, next slide, please. Um, this initiative, as well as uh, numerous uh, previous ones, which we've held round uh, about sustainability issues have, of course, also been supported very directly um, by a lot of uh, a lot of uh, initiatives and programs uh, around MIT, but also outside in Germany, uh, we have uh, as uh, the key sponsor to this event, uh, the BMW uh, Group uh, and the BMW Foundation as well. Uh, and as you can see, various others we've been working with in the past, not least uh, to say uh, TUM, uh, the Technical University of Munich, which has been playing a very important part for us, as well as, of course, also the Club of Rome uh, just at the end of last year. So uh, with all these partners, uh, we uh, get insights, we get experts uh, talking to us, and we get contacts, which we're also happy to share with anyone who wants to reach out. Uh, so please get in touch with us. We have a few QR codes at the bottom. They will also appear at the end again, if you don't uh, catch them now. Uh, but we also have uh, a, a post in the chats um, where you can see our LinkedIn site for the MIT Club of Germany. And fee please feel free uh, to connect with us through that if you have any questions. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to Sarah Simon, who so graciously uh, is hosting us today uh, through, again, the Energy, Environment and Sustainability Network. Sarah, great to have you and uh, great to hand over to you. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. I wanted to welcome everyone here today also. Uh, I do lead this network of MIT alumni groups mostly. Um, for more than a decade, we've, we've worked on educating and connecting and acting all of our different alumni and, and groups on these themes of our, of our name in our network. The MIT Club of Germany is a star actor in this 
situation. It's sustainability's chapter is moving ahead on the actions needed for a sustainable future. I, I have to just mention in this discussion with, with this webinar that many MIT alumni and the public in the US today are looking at challenges posed by global warming in terms of climate change. Although we use our analytical and numerical skills every day, many of us are not in the business of clean energy and innovative carbon reduction strategies and the circular economy. We have not, many of us, heard of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. That always amazes me. Uh, we often don't understand what a circular economy is. We do not understand all the ongoing work in our cities and other regions, which is where the, the rubber is going to hit the road, where we have to make these changes and find the solutions. We don't always connect to water and food system issues with everything else. So although alumni often focus merely, I uh, shouldn't say merely, but focus on advocating for government policy here in the US, many are learning that a circular economy beyond the solar panels on our roof and electric cars is so important. The Smart Circular Cities program of the sustainability chapter of, of the Club of Germany will show us in this webinar what kinds of things we can actually do. So thank you for uh, working with us on this, on this webinar and I now present you with Peter Clement. Okay, well, thank you, Sarah. It's great to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. Really appreciate it. Thanks also, Wolfgang, for the introduction to the club and our partner ecosystem, which is very important. And, and, and for those of you who know the UN Sustainable Development Goals, as Sarah pointed out, yeah, there is the goal number 17, which talks about partnership. Yeah, for the goals. And, and, and that's, I think, our mantra from a club perspective to bring all these partners together uh, inside and outside of MIT. And you have seen the slide and that was just the selection. So we created something that we call the sustainability impact platform. And the idea is really uh, uh, to bring different organizations together and create impact in sustainability, of course, as the name suggests, of course. Uh, but then we pick specific topics and we call them think and do tanks. Uh, you can see them also here on the slide. I don't think to need to read them out. Think and do tank because we not only want to talk and think, we also want to do something. And, and some examples of doing are uh, at the bottom half of the slide. So we co-authored some uh, publications, for example, around Industry 4.0 and sustainability with Platform Industry 4.0. For those of you who don't know it, that's a government-sponsored entity in Germany who looks into manufacturing and digitization and sustainability in manufacturing. We had a, a, a big event uh, last uh, year with BMW and Truman Circle in Munich which kicked off the Smart Circular Cities program. And obviously we have included uh, the startups as well. And for the startups, specifically the four that we will hear from today and see, we have created a, a mentorship program where we provide them not only with mentors from the MIT alumni base globally, but also from our network specifically here in Germany. So let me show you the Smart Circular Cities program. Very quickly, we started last year in Munich with a physical event framing the problem. We discussed a couple of problem areas and we presented some solutions, specifically the startups that you see today presented there in person. Yeah. Uh, then we set up uh, this mentorship program where we have mentors, we have workshop and exposure of the startups to the MIT network globally. And then we close out essentially uh, in uh, fall or autumn this year with a second big event together with our partner Technical University of Munich, which we uh, currently call Ecosystems for uh, Solution. And uh, that's more how you can, how you need an ecosystem of partners so that actually solutions get adopted and can be successfully implemented. And the model that we will use for this event from an idea perspective is the 
uh, MIT Read model. If you don't know it, there's a URL there. Just uh, Google it, so to speak. Yeah, uh, that describes essentially how you set up an innovation ecosystem in a specific region to achieve uh, goals. Yeah, and you can of course do this also with sustainability. Good. So that's essentially a little bit about our. Um, activities around sustainability and then it's a utmost pleasure to introduce Philip Gerbert to you uh, our moderator for today I remember Philip um, you were actually the moderator of our very first sustainability event of the MIT Club of Germany I remember we had people from the MIT Energy Initiative from the UN FCCC and it was really an experiment back then almost two years or even more ago and we were not sure uh what comes out of it yeah, and, and here we are again so thanks again uh, for joining us and i will let you maybe talk a little bit about yourself and what tom venture labs and you are doing and then with this uh, i hand it over to you and leave the stage to you and thanks for joining us excellent and thank you very much peter for the kind introduction it's a privilege to be here right to uh, back at the mit stage um I, I, I love MIT because I met my wife there, and also it's, uh, you know, I was a physicist there, course eight, and she biologist there, course seven. Perhaps briefly, um, for, for my background, um, I, I spent, you know, about half my time, my professional life in the US, in, in, in Boston and Silicon Valley, and I've been focused on technology for a long time. But so on in, in one, one hand, it's really, so to say, deep tech, AI and quantum, etc. But the other part was always in energy technology, actually worked a lot with the World Economic Forum, World Energy Council, and also with the entire German industry on climate paths for Germany, how to decarbonize Germany. It's interesting that the industry took the initiative, uh, and not the government, you know, to, to show how to do it without hurting the economy. And, and interacted a lot with Ernst Muniz, of course, you know, who was uh, no, a colleague of mine a long time ago. Now, um, Perhaps just two words about the TUM and the TUM Venture Labs. I mean, two things you might want to know about the Technical University of Munich. It's uh, for a year now has been the top ranked university in the uh, European Union across all rankings, um, which which you know is, was was quite you know an achievement. Uh, so a continuous rise over the last twenty years. And the second thing, its strategy is actually to become the entrepreneurial university, and that's so ambitious that the the president wants to establish entrepreneurship as a third pillar next to research and education. And you know, all the strategic initiatives are there. And one of them is the creation of the Tom Venture Labs, which is a network of 12 deep tech labs that collaborate very closely that are ramping up across it. And that really goes from aerospace to quantum, from healthcare to food agrobiotech from robotics to energy, you name it, right? And, and, and several of the startups, I mean, some of the startups here, and, and we are responsible for about 20% of the German startup landscape and, and uh, trying to go into deep tech big time, okay? I think that's enough from, from, from my side. Now, if you can perhaps give us maybe the next slide, I would like to introduce our distinguished um, presenters today. So um, we have four startups presenting today here in uh, smart circular cities. By the way, I'm located here in the, appropriately in the Munich Urban Collab, <laughs> uh, which, you know, in the Serbian city. Um, that's at one point Anne-Marie Pellegrin, um, the communications manager of uh, DKSR. DKSR is a German abbreviation for Data Competence Center for Cities and Regions and focuses on municipalities, enterprises, and database solutions. I briefly introduce also the other panelists and then you know, hand over to you, um, Anne-Marie. We also have you know, Sebastian Daus from Fix First. Um, uh, as you can imagine, Fix First stands precisely for what you would think. <laughs> it's you know, fix things first and uh, you know, not, not throw them away and really trying to uh, introduce repairs into the general you know, recycling and circular economy. Um, Sebastian started doing that uh, when he was at school, um, when he, he did lots of, you know, in his spare time, and then uh, extended that. Um, first had a big, you know, stint, stints at at Uber and and, and other um, uh, digital uh, companies, and then really founded Fix First. And we will have uh, Zara Fleischer from Two Zero. Um, be a different thing. Two Zero um, is in the business of recycling lithium-ion batteries. 
as you might know, it's one of the largest um, circular economy issues out there to really recover all the critical materials from lithium ion batteries, uh, given the current ECAL uh, future. Now, um, Sarah is actually a mechanical engineer from Tom, so we're very happy at it. Perhaps two things you might want to know about her first. TU Munich, what they also did have a very strong student initiative, so they won every single contest Elon Musk ever put out there, in particular all the four Hyperloop contests, as she was part of one winning of the Hyperloop contests. Uh, um, she was also part of a very distinguished honorary degree at CDTM, et cetera. Then, I mean, she made a slight mistake. She actually went um, up the river and spent some time at Harvard, uh, where she focused on lab to market. At least she did, you know, Air Force uh, technologies to market. So um, if you ever think you lost your technical skills, that were probably due to this short stint there. And then the last um, speaker we have is Miriam Yanke here from uh, Drill Echo. So Miriam started her entrepreneurial journey already at the age of 14, and uh, then she co-founded Trileco a couple of years back, and Trileco really tries to, you know, focus on greenhouse gas emissions via, you know, doing digital twins and um, uh, helping companies to get to net zero, okay? So we really have, I think, a very strong panel, and with that, I would like to hand over to Anne-Marie Pellegrin and um, tell us about DKSR. I'm not in the stage is yours. Yes, thank you. Thanks for the introduction also. And I'll just um, start sharing my slides. I hope you can, can you see them already? No, okay. So now hopefully. Now we can, yeah. Yes, great. Okay, so yes, um, I'm Anne-Marie. I'm here representing um, DKSR or the Data Competence Center for Cities and Regions as the communications manager. As uh, Philip already mentioned, this is a German abbreviation for a very long and complicated name as we Germans like it. So um, what are we doing as decays are. As we all know, cities are growing and growing and urban processes along that are becoming more and more complex. Cities are by now responsible for more than two thirds of global emissions and energy consumption. And the ones responsible to make municipalities and cities more sustainable are municipal governments and companies. In our opinion, they are the key players. and. We believe at DKSR that a huge chance for making smarter decisions and make process management smarter too for municipalities is the strategic use of urban data. So this is where we and our offer comes into play. Pleased to meet you, we're DKSR. Um, we're a spin-off of, among others, the Fraunhofer Research Society, which some of you may know. Um, we were founded by our CEO, Alanos from Radetzky, who has a long history with the Fraunhofer Morgenstadt uh, Innovation Network too. And we provide municipalities and municipal companies a unique combination of consultancy, of technological infrastructure, and the networking in our community to enable cities and municipal companies to make use of urban data um, to face their challenges in a sustainable manner. What makes our offer? Um, we offer, as I already mentioned, our consultancy, um, mainly to, in terms of um, data governance and data strategies to our municipal clients. Then we offer them networking in our um, data community to make digital and database solutions comprehensive. And at the core of it all, we all offer our open source urban data platform to put data into use. What does the center of our offer do? Basically, the goal of the data platform is to free data from silos, from silos of organizations, from silos of departments or single cities, and put it into use efficiently and in a comprehensive manner. For this, um, on our platform, we put together data, for example, concerning energy consumption, geo data, um, concerning traffic processes from cities, 
and uh, from sources such as floating cars, from smart meters or CO2 sensors, we harmonize and aggregate them and make them usable for different diverse solutions and applications. This can be EV charging monitoring, it can be climate dashboards or flexible energy management, real-time traffic management, really applications in every area of cities and municipalities, um, just as the client needs them. Many companies uh, provide technological services like ours, but um, our special benefit is that we're working completely open source. So our platform code is open source as well as codes from the implementations we create. We provide this for collaborative optimization of the solution that can be implemented, for example, um, by se several cities at the same time. So they can work together on the same solution for several municipalities. Um, another benefit is that uh, the platform is compatible with other platform via common standards and that municipalities have maximum sovereignty and flexibility on solution level. So if a solution from a third party provider that is sets on top of our platform infrastructure doesn't work for them, they can easily switch to another solution that works better. Um, the goal of this all is to really lay the basis for a comprehensive implementation of the solutions we create. And for this, we also offer the urban data community. This is a community of municipal governments and companies with the goal to drive forward digitization together and strategically use the urban data for comprehensive effects. And we offer them yeah, various formats and the um, organizational infrastructure to get into action here. This means that we're working together with several municipal, we can work together with several municipalities at the same time creating solutions and putting them into implementation. Here on the left, you can see the applications that are already planned um, in development or applied in cities and regions. And the code of these applications is uh, published open source on GitHub and described also as an application on our web portal, DK's R Square which works like an app store in the end where municipalities can just choose the application they need. Yeah, this is basically our offer. I hope I broke it down well to you. If you have any questions, I'm looking forward to them. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Anne-Marie. Um, uh, we, we would like to you know, have all the panelists presenting first and then perhaps do the questions overall if that's okay for you. So the next person I would like to call to on stage is uh, Sebastian Daus, so our fixer. So uh, Sebastian, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Philip. Um, thanks for the kind introduction, the fixer. Um, all right, so yeah, hi everyone. Um, my name is Sebastian. I'm one of the founders at Fix First, a um, Berlin-based company with one foot in Munich, as I always used to say. And what we do is basically, yeah, we want to end the throwaway world and making repair and circularity easy. Um, and to start with, you probably know it, tried it yourself. So I'm not sure if or what you have tried to fix in the past. We are focused on electronics. Um, and we started out as a V2C marketplace. So if you would have had any problem with, for, yeah, let's say, a washing machine, you would come to us and we would help you do that. What we realized in, the, in actually doing that is that the whole partner ecosystem, you know, like a mix of service providers, local repair shops who are doing repairs, and um, like the, the brands who are also working with them, is a very dusty and old school process. Um, and that actually leads to the result that you face as a customer. You know, often it's too costly, it takes forever. Um, you can only reach them via phone and email. You know, we are used to have everything delivered on demand, this kind of you were Airbnb like experience. 
Um, that's not really attractive. So in the end, um, that's one of the reasons why our products end up in waste. And electronic waste is one of the fastest growing waste streams. Most of the emissions, as you already know, are already in the products that we are producing. Um, so it might actually sense to actually just use them a little bit longer and find a better business model also for the companies around them. And that was our idea and the way we um, started into looking at this problem. And we figured out we'd actually need to tackle um, three different pillars step by step on how we can you know, change the system more systematically. So what we are doing, and there's a lot of text on the slide, I'm gonna break it down for you, but it's basically uh, a SaaS enabled B2B platform um, that helps bring companies together and helps them launch scale and innovate all those circular service operations, but also keeps the materials in use. And the way we're gonna do this is by first focusing on the software and the repair flow itself. So we make it as easy and as efficient um, for service companies. Um, that could be like a local repair shop that uses our platform. Um, but then we also thought about the ecosystem, like how can we bring the service capacity and the people who are already sitting on top of the products and materials together with everybody who needs them and want to embed them into their service um, offerings, like the manufacturers, retailers, or insurance companies. This is what we do, and we just launch as like a B2B marketplace um, for connecting companies in the B2B space. And lastly is something um, that we're currently exploring, um, also partly with cities. Uh, is what we call the lifecycle manager that focuses on the products and wants to help you as a customer, um, but probably first as a business to extend the lifetime of your products and manage your resources in a better way. Um, and this is how it looks like a bit more in detail. So on the one hand side, um, we have our software platform. So that really helps um, manage day-to-day -day operations for the service companies and also for the brands. So imagine if you're sending a repair request Someone has to check uh, what you do, um, like uh, they have to find a technician, they're going to send you a cost estimate, doing work reports, driving there, like all this real um, operational stuff. We help them do that in a digital and easy way. So our software has been named super user friendly, um, but it can also be used by brands. So for example, a manufacturer, retailer, someone else can bring their whole service partner network on one single platform and they see exactly what's happening on the operation side. They know what happens to their products in the market, what errors happen. So um, to basically kickstart any other circular operations or initiatives like refurbishment um, um, yeah, projects, uh, we give them a data foundation to actually do that. And they can be part of the workflow um, of repair as well. So this is really the core and anchor of uh, yeah, where we're at and what we're doing right now. Um, as I mentioned, we just uh, launched a B2B marketplace. So uh, we often found that often also service companies would have an inventory uh, or access of all products and spare parts, but um, they uh, often would order, let's say, even a new spare part if they, uh, someone else next door would have that in their inventory. So what we try to do is really match not only service capacity, um, but also the materials in the industry as well. Um, and we now even offer companies to set a buyback um, um, program in place for certain products that they are searching for um, and match them on the B2B side. And last but not least, and this is something we are uh, also uh, currently testing together with cities is um, yeah making repair easy and accessible for consumers. So what we do the, here is basically giving you a booking interface, similar to like an Airbnb or Uber, where you can manage the assets or your products that you already have at home. We can directly link you with the, um, uh, all the service partners that you need and show you different ideas and things how you can extend the lifetime um, of those products. And we're also going to measure the impact of that, uh, which is especially super interesting um, for businesses who are trying to reduce their carbon footprint and be more circular and material efficient as well. And uh, we've been doing this, um, yeah, starting now with the B2B marketplace, with mostly focusing on electronics, mostly in Germany um, and in Austria. Uh, we have a lot of interesting uh, things in place in the markets. I'm going to uh, tell you more about that in a second. And uh, but also going to expand to different product categories and a few super cool brands. Uh, that we're working with. Uh, one example is Miele, who we actually met through one of the startup programs of Unternehmer to called Tech Founders. So thank you again for that. And uh, that we are um, yeah, still working with. Um, the market is super exciting. You all know the circular economy is a really big topic, um, focusing on repair. Um, it's a super an emerging field. And there's a couple of interesting trends that I feel like um, yeah, you should also hear about. Um, I mean, one is, of course, if you think about the waste hierarchy, right? So, on top, everybody should avoid it. And then on the bottom, we now have, I would say, landfill and recycling. Most of the people talk about recycling, but we actually want to go on top into repairing and reusing products more and more. Uh, and we believe the market is actually going to benefit also from the current crisis. 
Um, and there's a lot of regulatory things uh, happening, especially in Europe, um, also partially in the US on the right to repair side. Um, there are electronics companies who announced they're going to do something. Some like Apple they did something about this already. We have to discuss about the execution of that, but basically there's a lot of things changing and companies really seizing this um, as an opportunity right now. Um, and so I already have uh, we, so we've been running a few uh, campaigns like together with the World Economic Forum, really advocating for this company, uh, like for the topic and really helping companies to uh, transform on that side um, as well. And yeah, this is us. So myself, I've been working in venture development for a little bit, um, having had some repair exposure also there to the, the business of my uh, my father uh, back in school, even uh, my co-founder, I keep taking care of the technical side. We're still like a small tech team um, backed by an amazing uh, crowd of mentors uh, and startup programs uh, already here. Um, I see the MIT club logo is still missing here. We're going to add that later. Um, but what unites us is really is the vision to yeah, accelerate circularity and as we call it true, create a world where fixing products um, comes first because product lifetime extension, let's say if you only do one repair, maybe you can do the two or three years later, we can actually uh, reuse a lot of emissions um, and also find a better business model for companies that brings them closer to their customers. So that's it from my side. Um, if you know anybody doing something with repair circularity, we're super open to to talk to them, connect with them. Uh, we're also raising funds. Um, if you have any connections about that, that uh, would be super helpful to get in, get in touch. Um, but yeah, other than that, see you later on the panel and uh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Sebastian. Very impressive. And hopefully, you know, the finally changing regulation will help you a little bit on that. So but if you if you repair it, you know, and, and have a second life and third life, ultimately you will need to recycle. <laughs> so uh, let me hand over to, to Sarah here from to zero and say, what do you actually do about this recycling part? Uh, I don't no one has to be convinced of the importance, but how do you actually do it? Sarah and stage zero. Thank you so much. Um, let me quickly share my screen. Hello, everybody. My name is Sarah. I'm the co-founder and also CEO of uh, Two Zero. And today I will be talking about how we truly bring lithium-ion battery waste to zero. So we are facing human uh, humans' uh, most complex uh, problem in history, which is tackling climate change. Um, I think most of these numbers on this slide are quite familiar, and we are already seeing a lot of efforts from us um, trying to change this by electrifying most of the aspects, bringing in more and more batteries to reduce these global emissions. What this eventually means is that we will see a, trem a tremendous amount of increase of battery production. In Europe alone, we will have a 20 times more battery production for uh, within this decade. And what a lot of people do not know is due to this, we will face a lot of waste. Um, so <laughs> this is a big graphic. Um, uh, this will increase to 1 million tons uh, by 2030. Most people think, uh, wait a minute, uh, you know, electrical cars, uh, the, these have only been recently released on the roads. How can it be that we will already face so much uh, battery waste already now? Um, here's a nice graphic to kind of showcase where this battery waste will derive from. So most of it will come from uh, gigafactory production scrap directly, uh, over 50%. Then yes, we have consumer electronics, so uh, everything um, that is in your pockets, uh, you know, iPhones, um, smartphones, but also laptops and other devices and the field batteries uh, coming from electrical vehicles will be coming in slowly in the next years, but not um, portraying the large amount in the pie chart. And this will slowly shift in the next 10 years where the EV batteries, uh, battery waste will um, outperform the production scrap. So this is what we will be facing here in Europe. Um, a lot of people think um, there must be a solution to recycle these lithium ion batteries. However, this is currently where they end up, landfills. Most of the batteries end up in the landfills. You can ask yourself, when was the last time you paid attention to throw your electrical tooth, uh, you know, toothbrush uh, in a garbage 
or actually disposing it in a proper uh, battery recycling facility. Um, so most people just throw their electrical devices into the trash and this will end up here, even here in Germany. The second method, uh, what has been doing, uh, which is kind of the status quo of recycling, I call it battery waste reduction, is smelting. So smelting, or in professional words, pyrometallurgy, is where you toss batteries in very high temperatures of over 1,400 degrees, and you literally smelt everything away. More than half of the critical materials and precious metals are lost in this process. Um, you can only win back nickel and cobalt, but all the other valuable ma uh, materials like lithium and also graphite, uh, also manganese are lost in this process. So this uh, another additional thing is uh, we are here in Europe. Europe uh, is as a continent, I would say one of the most sustainable, cautious um, countries uh, among uh, in the world. And they have already announced really tight regulations starting by 2030. So by 2030, every lithium ion battery should more or less be recycled. Uh, they have put up the number 70%. Today, this is 50%. Um, also, once you recycle, the rates of the recovery rate have to be quite high. So for cobalt, nickel, and also copper, it's 95%. And for lithium, it's 70%. And uh, also a very striking new regulation that is coming up, and this will also create a lot of headache for battery producers and OEMs, that every single new battery being produced by 2030 have to entail a certain amount of percentage of recycled materials. Um, so let's say here 12% of cobalt have to come from a recycled source, um, which is a great market for recyclers. And this is exactly what we're going to do at 2.0. We will literally be in the last step of the value chain of batteries. Um, so after they have been produced, used, um, collected uh, properly, um, there they will be crushed. Black mass is produced, which is kind of a powder form of your shredded battery. That's what we take in as an input through our process. And then we produce back all the raw materials like lithium, nickel, cobalt, manganese, and graphite, bring them back to the supply chain so that we can produce new battery cells out of these raw materials. And by the way, all of these raw materials do not exist here in Europe. So we will be a local source here for the European continent. Um, so this is who we are. We are quite a small, um, but very fastly growing uh, young startup. We are only six months old. Uh, this is already the team. And uh, we are already backed as a startup. Uh, we raised 3.5 million euros in our first funding round uh, half a year ago uh, from great uh, investors like Atlantic Labs who led our round, uh, but also uh, phenomenal uh, business angels like Jochen Heitzmann, the former board member of Volkswagen. So we're very honored to have these great supporters. And Anyone can reach out to us either. We are always hiring, so you can apply and look at our open positions. But if you are in a commodity player uh, or commodity business, battery production uh, business, uh, OEM business, please reach out to us. We're happy to connect and truly bring lithium ion battery waste to zero. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Sarah, for this uh, impressive um, you know, new perspective on what, what is there to come and how you're trying to solve it. And uh, last but not least, I would like to um, hand over to Miriam Janke um, on you know, how to do GHC, you know, uh, greenhouse gas reductions, also with all kind of modern technology. Miriam, uh, the stage is yours. Exactly. Thank you so much, Philip. I'm just like sharing my screen. So can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Awesome, beautiful. So as said at the beginning, I have a cold a little bit. So i uh, apologizing for my voice, um, but I really wanted to do that. As Philip was introducing, I'm the co-founder and we let go. And uh, we are pretty much focusing on following challenges. I mean, we all know 2050 emission reductions, companies have to get to net zero, so important. Otherwise, they're going to pay millions. Then, of course, which is really tricky, is like the GHD scope three. And we do the integration there because um, last year we developed with the state of Brandenburg um, a module for GHD scope one, two, three um, to solve this issue immediately. 
And then, of course, because of the recent uh, geopolitical events, energy prices just race to the top. So um, a lot of like price sensitive industries are really under pressure. So this is why a couple of years back, we developed our platform for clean data, like a digital twin platform coming from the IoT spectrum. And um, how does it actually like work? So, I mean, like we firstly, we firstly, especially focusing on manufacturing and logistics, as you maybe also can see in the picture. So there we integrate the platform into um, the production facility, for example, and connecting like the shop floor data, like the machine sensors and all the devices with the business data that you do not have uh, segmented data, data anymore so that you have like one platform where all the data is combined and then we visualize the data in dashboards and you can use that for EC reporting and so on to be compliant and then most importantly in digital twin so in that sense you are reaching a full data transparency and you can see optimization potentials and then you can take actions because you do not need to think that this section need to be increased by efficiency you know that this one for example is like a problem because you can understand and see the data and then because it's an iot no code platform we have like a high flexibility and agility and can support our clients customers partner to create like digital solutions for them when we always like say, you know, may, what makes us different than the other parts? I mean, like there are, for example, local platforms out there as Johnson Control and Mendix. They are mostly like very complex, uh, very expensive, and they do not focus on the sustainability aspect, right? And in comparison to that, we are a local platform, which gives us more, you know, um, creativity or like uh, more that the customer has like full control without IT knowledge about to create. And um, on the other side, we have like, for example, like Planetly, who was just like recently bought by One Trust or Plan A, where they offer like a SaaS platform where com uh, companies can upload the data and then they do, you know, carbon dioxide reduction with like consulting parts. So in comparison to that, we are not doing any kind of consultancy. Um, there we have like a strong partner as PwC who's helping us in that. So we are our full software provider to do implementation actions and first of all to reach data transparency to see optimization potentials so there's just like two use cases which i was bringing up one we did um first of all implemented the the platform in uh, a factory for example created digital twin you can like see their heat maps we can because we created last year also the the carbon dioxide module the state of brand mode for seven hundred thousand euros um, we can also do like heat maps with like the carbon dioxide of scope one, two, three, for example, that you can see immediately um, what you're dealing with and where to tackle the problem. And then here we did like um, um, yeah process optimization kind of that stuff. Um, there's like another use case where we implemented the platform, did a digital twin, which data transparency again, and then also implemented our energy management tool and then um, and planet said solutions like waypoint tracking and so on because they had also like a big security issue there which we fixed and uh, also reduced the electricity by 30 percent where we can go deeper into that in the q a of course uh, we're also looking at a smart city provider for example and providing one company like because it's the platform is based on microservices we are handing to the smart city company also um, the 3D part that they really can visualize and do also like a network digital trend regarding the sustainability actions. So there are like a lot of opportunities which we can like, you know, explain. Our business model is pretty easy, I would say. It's a normal SaaS uh, enterprise license agreement. And the second one is a disruptive revenue model, which we're always using when we say, hey, um, you know, we're going to take a percentage of your savings and um, combine that with an enterprise license agreement to be like very flexible in that. And who's behind Trileco um, when you're asking? So um, Hans and me are the co-founders. Hans worked like for 30 years at Microsoft. We're setting up 25 countries there. Um, I'm responsible of the BMW Foundation. Timo worked in, at Nokia and IBM before. And Giraud, our lovely CTO, was appointed by Forbes 30 and 30 and did uh, a lot of like Google and Cisco projects. So anyway, then we have like a um, software developer. So we are like a team of 12 people 
And uh, yeah, really passionate about the topic. And this is my LinkedIn QR code. And we definitely looking for, you know, early adopters who want to work with us. And uh, yeah, feel free to reach out, I would say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miriam and all the panelists. Um, I would actually um, ask you to all turn, all the panelists turn on your cameras as we enter the discussion now. And I would um, also like, I see there's already quite some activity in the chat. So I think in the Q and A, as some of the questions I would also like to pick up here in the panel overall. So first of all, you know, I, I think it's, it's fair to say, you know, where, where have you seen the biggest impact so far? Or what are the most promising use cases, highest impact cases? And I guess I would start with Anne-Marie, and that was also a question in the chat, so to say, perhaps you can comment on that a bit. And as you know, we have part of a US audience, you know, they also want to say, when when can they get it to the US? Right? <laughs> uh, not, uh, I mean, I know you are in the UK already, perhaps you can comment on that, but you know, what? when will you go transatlantic? <laughs> Yes, of course. Um, thanks for the interesting questions. Um, as for the common or popular solutions, I think anything in the area of mobility, traffic management is very popular right now. As mobility itself, um, I kind of see it as a, an um, umbrella area covering many other areas or having touch points and um, impact also on many different things, just as friendly neighborhoods or smart neighborhoods on health challenges or air quality. Um, so one or two solution examples from this would be, for example, the coordination of sharing vehicles, which is um, very in trend right now and um, so we take data for example from e-scooters or and data from um, public transport and data from um, sharing cars merge them together and see where vehicles are needed for example where maybe events from the city take place so um, sharing providers can um, prepare for that, make vehicles available, and yeah, provide good alternatives for individual transport and reduce cars in city centers. This would be one very popular solution, which can be implemented with uh, an, a data platform just perfectly. And another solution that is trending is the monitoring of EV charging infrastructure, actually. So you take um, data from sensors on the street and also from um, EV charging and put them together to see whether vehicles are wrongly parked there. And you can send a notice to the concerning administration so they can send over um, people to get rid of the wrongly parked cars and make the space available who, to e-vehicles who really want to charge there. Yeah, and as for the US part, I think I already answered that um, in written terms. Um, our platform is not in implementation in the EES US yet, we are now consulting US municipalities too, but it's available on demand. Excellent, thank you very much, Anne-Marie. Since we also work actually with um, Breakthrough Energy, if I were Bill Gates, I would I would challenge you on uh, the precise gigatons you're, you're, you're trying to, then, but I let you off the hook here, right? But, uh, let's turn to Sebastian here, right? Uh, Sebastian, um, I mean, it's, the, the highest impact, I think, for you is also quite interesting. And as you saw in the chat, people asked, you know, what about um, electric uh, appliances like uh, air conditioners versus electronics, uh, which I think is a fair question. So perhaps you can, uh, because, you know, you throw away those and they, they seem to be easier to repair, right? So perhaps you can answer a little bit on, you know, where you, where you see the biggest potential from your side. Why did you focus on electronics? And do they understand it correctly? Emilia obviously has all of it, you know. And and, um, and and where you see, see you know what's working already. Sure, happy to. Um, yeah, I think one of the reasons why we focus on electronics is because it's a, 
uh, like one of the fastest growing and also most toxic uh, toxic waste streams. Um, and yeah, we have a lot of, especially now, the whole political discussion, right, about uh, material security, um, resource independence, um, things like that. And there's a lot of material already inside there. And also, quite frankly, because that's what we knew well, like coming from our personal background, I think like having some some insight as a foreigner to a certain market was something that uh, we wanted to have, um, like when we started the company and something that we can relate to uh, personally as well. Um, but the other part was also, if you look at the, or like the question, like why now, um, there were those a lot of regulatory enablers already coming into play. So we started initially with like large home appliances. Sounds really counterintuitive, but um, as you mentioned, there's not really from a customer experience point of view, it was like a really sh shitty process to be very honest. Um, but also a lot of regulation coming into place that now we see tickling our down into different um, different industries as well. But we are super open for that. Um, I mean, in the in the chat, I already mentioned it's a bit of a specific question. I would say for like different um, uh, like different markets that you actually also look into. Um, but um, our software, I mean, is now um, if you're asking what's working, why it is able to cover not only small and large electronics but also remote services in. We would even go as far as saying it doesn't really matter anymore which product categories, but uh, from a position point of view, we really want to be um, the best right now in electronics because there's a lot of things changing, there's a lot of network effects involved. So uh, in terms of focus, that's uh, really where we want to play. Yeah. Very cool. Thank you very much. And perhaps just to to jump very quickly to to Miriam, actually, and um, um, perhaps I mean there were a few questions out there in terms of you know it's it's great what you're doing there. Uh, are you actually are you actually using so to say your your own stuff? I mean, is it is it you who does it, and how how can we how can we imagine you know how you get the impact of it? Mm. Hmm. I mean, like right now, I'm like always like saying we are. Um, still a product i mean it's a platform but after mm -hmm. we're gonna like uh, raise um we turn it like more into a platform this means that we also implement it to you know our clients and they can build application workflows and processes by themselves right so and this is what we're also working with pwc on that they can use our platform to really go to their clients to build everything on our platform so right now we are still in the platform product phase i would say so we we are still like a platform but we are always like creating the solutions by ourselves because we have the expertise and like for the next um for the next phase we need first of all like additional money but also second that uh, the you know uh, german industry is like not so uh, far forward that they would like trust of course like a platform from like a startup to build like applications um, within their houses so you know we are still like the, the preface but of course i mean when looking at the future um we are working on a couple of projects with uh, consultancies that they're going to use our platform in future but it will take a couple of months if we stay i would say to this state cool thanks a lot man. um now Turning to Sarah, right? You're, you're still in the pre-commercial stage, if I understand it correctly. Please correct me. So the, the questions here are obviously how, how how fast will be the solutions available? And there's some of them that you know already question: you know, are you well protected? Uh, <laughs> what's the technology really using? You have to see what you want to answer there. But I guess to say, you know, when when will your stuff be available? And um, and what's your path for competitive differentiation uh, would be? So you can comment yeah, on that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Many, many questions. Uh, let's start with the, with the first one. Uh, we are already out of lab scale. So we are already producing, for example, lithium back, recurring that from the black mass. So it's not theory on paper. We're already up and running uh, in our plant um, and scaling up uh, towards processing several tons uh, within this year. Um, so that's our current status. Of course, the technology is completely protected uh, or the IP is um with a lot of uh, ip protection strategies uh working on patents here as well so the entire thing is protected so bsf what i saw in the comments cannot just copy us um so what we will produce will be the lithium uh, or the two zero lithium for example or the two zero nickel the two zero um and uh, cobalt and so on um so that's definitely secured um what was the third question 
<laughs> well, obviously, Martin asked uh, quite a bit about the technical details. Now, I have to uh, warn you, um, uh, Martin uh, does have a background with RWTH Aachen, which, which hosts one of your competitors. So you have to be careful what you answer or don't answer at this point in time about your technology. <laughs> I, I, can, I, I can be very brief, uh, or it's not a secret, but well, my co-founder is also from RWTH Aachen, so it's the best of the best. <laughs> Uh, a best mix, let's say, TU Munich and uh, RWTH Aachen. Um, uh, the, the technology is using a wet chemical process called hydrometallurgy. So it's not, um, I think, uh, what someone wrote here, uh, electrochemistry. It's not, it's not that. I think there, I believe there's also a startup in MIT doing that. Um, so no, we're doing hydrochemistry and it's highly efficient uh, and able to be scalable. Oh, cool. um... Thank you very much. Um, now, uh, turning to Sebastian, perhaps a little bit into a slightly different question. You know, you had a journey already. And I mean, what I found quite interesting, you actually, I mean, in your short life, you already pivoted, right? <laughs> uh, you started out B2C and went to B2B and so on. Uh, perhaps you can comment a little bit, A, how that felt uh, um, and how you succeeded, so to say, to go there and uh, why you did it and do we see the opportunity in it? Yeah, happy to. I mean, I guess we're probably not the first startup that pivoted the solution, right? If you look into research and things like that. But um, the uh, yeah, I mean, it's um, uh, on the on the startup side, we we actually came like from like try to reframe it. What's the problem that we try to solve, and how can we have a more scalable impact? And for the B two C model to to elaborate a little bit more, it's like um, on the B two C market, if you come to us with your repair problem. Um, the first challenge is you have to know about us. We have to acquire you as a customer. And uh, I know, I'm not sure if that's correct, but I think one of the most expensive keywords on Google, for as an example, uh, is if you're looking for, uh, if you have your key forgotten, right? Because everybody, you need a problem or so we have need a solution right now. Um, and companies are willing to pay for that. And with repair, it's probably not as critical, but for electronics where, um, you know, you need a solution fast, um, that's, almost a slight distance. So customer acquisition was one challenge on one on one side, but there's nothing that you can you know solve in the long term. The other part was um, if you're not vertically integrated from a business model point of view, so you're building up your own fleet and like people of technicians, and there are companies that also do that, um, then you're kind of dependent on all your service partner network. And managing the quality of that was a big challenge, like super intransparent, like especially if you focus on large appliances where the technician the technician is coming to your home and they don't know more about what's happening than you actually do as a platform um, if they're not working with the software. So we already thought, okay, how can we actually solve that problem? And we would have needed to build a software solution uh, kind of anyways. And then COVID hit and we had those challenges already facing in the, in the business model. Um, and at some point we asked ourselves, you know, like, but wait a second, like how are all the brands who are already working with the service partners, how are they solving these problems, right? We are not the first ones who are trying to make that happen. And it turns out they had exactly the same issues, um, partially if not even worse, uh, because they weren't as customer oriented as we were at that point. So um, in the end, we said, okay, let's just focus on that. And um, the, the impact and scalability is also much higher of that, right? Because the other part for us in terms of vision and mission would have been Either we are like the one premium positioned and nice fancy uh, repair service offering for just let's say washing machines in the main cities in Germany, or we are that um, scalable solution that actually tries to go through the root cause of the problems and try to unbundle um, all the you know all the process and collaboration aspect. So that definitely was the I think the the bigger point um, for that. Personally, it's a bit of. Um, mind change right because you go to market is different it's suddenly a different target group you're always thinking b2b to c with your customers because they're solving a problem for them that they have because of their customers but uh there was quite a change and as you know uh, also in explaining uh because a lot of people still think that we be, do b2c um but yeah we are we are unbundling that i would say very cool frankly i mean i I'm very relieved to do the switch uh, because it's incredibly hard to sell the B2C, what you, as you as you saw, and and it's fantastic how many innovation prices you have. But a warning in sustainability: um, the road to bankruptcy is plastered with innovation prices, right? <laughs> prices. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 you have to focus on business. Very cool. So, Anne-Marie, perhaps also turning to you a little bit, you know, because one thing that's obviously cities are fantastic and. I've seen so many things, you know, trying to do holistic solutions for cities, but trying to sell a holistic solution to a city is is, is a nightmare, right? They they typically always, you know, they they went well. They want to 
to give it to some department and you say, well, I'm not a department guy. I want to do a holistic solution, right? So how do you, how do you scale, right? <laughs> how do we scale? Okay, so this is a very complex question, I think, because we're facing multiple challenges here, like, uh, Overall, with the German administration, with it, which has very strong structures and very hierarchical structures and uh, departments that are yeah, responsible for very certain things and digitization and uh, data usage is just uh, on top of them all. So in the end, no one feels responsible. Yeah, it's uh, complicated, I guess. Um, then again, you have the problem that um, the challenge is not a technological one, I think, but um, yeah, an organizational and cultural one. We have this thing called not invented here syndrome. So um, basically, Munich doesn't take over any solutions made in Berlin, and Berlin doesn't want to take over any solutions made in Munich to yeah, have a site just two famous players who uh, yeah, like to do their own projects. Um, I think to scale what we're just doing right now, being active at right now is mainly responding to tenders that are already on a political mission to face this issue. Like also German politics are seeing this challenge that we really need um, comprehensive infrastructure because everyone's just inventing the wheel all over again for themselves. So they're setting up um, programs and projects that um, take several municipalities and cities together to yeah, use the same infrastructure to actually make an impact. Um, so yeah, this is like our main strategic goal right now to get into these projects, for example, now in Bavaria, we're um, doing a project called Twin Buy, where we're providing digital twins for multiple municipalities all over Bavaria. So um, while this project is limited to a few years, at the end of those years, all these municipalities will work with the DKSR urban data platform as an open source infrastructure to implement their solutions. Yeah, so yeah, it takes a lot of political willingness to in this context, I think. And yeah, that's what oh, we are answering to as a company. Perhaps someone from this network here um, can connect it to C40, right? I mean, you know, these are the top 40 cities um, that are trying to address uh, um, with the World Economic Forum and, and, and separate from it um, a coalition where they're jointly trying to address these problems. Perhaps that can help a little bit. Um, there's, a question, there's a question in the audience, which I would perhaps put to Sarah, right? I mean, what about solar panels, right? You do batteries, you know, uh, could you also do solar panels? I mean, that they are, <laughs> they have recycling issues, right? Um, um, at least, you know, lots of people talk about that. Not as bad as batteries, of course. Um, any, any knowledge on that? Sorry, I just want to... Yeah, no, no, this is super interesting. Uh, actually, my co-founder is also uh, quite an expert in solar panels as well. Um, there will be a huge wave coming up of solar panel waste in, uh, I would say, starting from 2030. Um, they have been already used almost 20 years. People say solar panels can be used for 20 to 30 years. So there will be an upcoming wave of solar panel waste. However, the uh, recycling technology for solar panels is quite in the early, uh, I would say, baby infant steps uh, in R&D. Um, the technology is not ready yet um, to be industrialized, but definitely a great branch for to zero in the future. So definitely keeping an eye on that. Very cool. Um, I just, in general, I think lots of people in the audience are asking whether they can, you have your slides, perhaps you can think about it while we proceed here and give an answer in the end, whether you release your slides. From, from what I know, 
um, they are actually um, at that level. Pop we could make them available, but please give us a signal at the end of the things. Excellent. So that was the journey so far. Now, hurdles going forward. Um, you know, um, after all, you know, you always get the questions. You know, how fast will you really get? You know, gigatons of CO two or other? You know, other environmental goals, so to say, into that. The cities, cities are one of the big things. Um, any any idea? You know, in terms of, I mean, I guess Miriam, you already commented on that a little bit, but I still would like to go back to you and also say, you know, how, what's the biggest hurdle to scale this, you know, to make it available everywhere and uh, fast? <laughs> <laughs> I would say, I would like say the uh, first of all a good uh, question for them. Uh, first of all, of course, like the awareness that uh, people you know understand uh, the data. For example, when talking about the digital twin um, or like segmented data, they or siloed data, they don't have like access or uh, think like digital twin is just like a play around. Um, I do not know how it's like in, in America, but it especially like in Germany, I think there's like a still a little bit uh, education has to be happening, you know, how to use uh, data or like training up people uh, really that they can, you know, learn how to use this. Um, because like, you know, when thinking about the future, it also like it has to do like with circular economy and we imagine like always the company in the middle and the data you know, are uh, fluctuating or circling around, everything's connected. Like we're talking about interoperability, interconnectivity, like also between the departments. And if this is like happening, then of course um, we can like address um, the base of like data, um, the the issues like within the company or the issues with like the, the use of resources to really, you know, reduce it or like to increase the overall efficiency. Um, so, you know, back to your question, I think like the first step is like definitely awareness. And uh, when we started a couple of years back, we first like started out in Finland, uh, focusing more on the circular economy. Um, till till then, um, there we saw that there now is a like a huge step was like happening in terms of like education. Um, so you know, speaking about it, I think like panels like this like perfectly for that. Cool, Sebastian, from your side, what's your biggest? <laughs> Yeah, I think from from our point of view, so we are, I think, fortunate in the beginning, but also a bit probably naive that we can, uh, in the sense that we, uh, you know, would, yeah, work with like really large companies like pretty pretty soon and like spot a lot of interest, but uh, it challenges always like a super big organization like really, you know, working with them to like, um, yeah, transform like either a business model like often we see with circularity. It's like, oh, yeah, that's super interesting. Let's do something about that. But um, then, you know, it's not only about, let's say, a, dig uh, a digital transformation, but it's also about the product, the positioning, uh, your material stream. So I feel like it's a lot more complex and it's often um, you have to navigate where the starting point of the journey is for a company and where you stand um, on that and bring that as close together um, as possible. So I think that's that's a bit one way. Um, but um, yeah, I think for us, we are kind of working around that, right? I think one thing that I mentioned is um, that in terms of impact also, that we're not only focusing on making the, the service journey more more efficient um, on the one hand side and like taking things like skill shortage and stuff like that, uh, which is another discussion, but uh, really also taking the uh, material flows and excess. And we've seen it for, especially for electronics, the whole secondhand refurbishment market is growing like quite a lot. Um, and then with the B2B marketplace, really focusing on that part as well, which also can help us scale much faster um, at the end of the day. Um, so that's something that we're already exploring right now. So I think it's probably those two things um, I would say right now. But yeah, I think really the, the adoption and everything that comes around like IT integrations, ERP systems, CRM, uh, SAP, you know about that, right? So um, that's all the fun part and actually finding a faster way around that. Um, I think that's a bit um, uh, one of the challenges um, that we had, um, but yeah, I think we're in a good way to, to overcome that. Cool. I mean, um, Sarah, you might have seen, you already have some people offering you to introduce you, I hope it's to Tesla, no? um, um, let's see, <laughs> a major opportunity. So, uh, but another question that I think is fair, you mentioned obviously that you come in um, first one does second life and ultimately one uh, re result repurpose and recycle so on. The question is, um, I think the question was, uh, do, you, do you know how much is actually, uh, um, has a second life today, right? Um, is, is, 
Is that even a relevant market today for, for most of the batteries, in particular for electronics batteries? Yeah, uh, good question. We get this question uh, quite frequently. First off, uh, Second Life is fantastic uh, within the circularity of lithium-ion batteries. Maybe just for the people who don't understand up until when do actually lithium-ion batteries come to second life or why are they not used anymore for the first life is when the capacity of the battery reaches usually at 80 percentage that's the moment where you exchange the batteries for your device or um, your cars and those batteries will then be double checked um, the cell uh, will be probably dismantled and checked if the single cells can be reused or repurposed uh, re refurbished um, so currently there um, not a large percentage goes into second life. Um, I hear a lot of numbers from the OAMs that it's less than five percentage uh, just because it's too dangerous to use second life batteries. Um, if there is anything broken or damaged, uh, it can easily catch fire and explode. You don't want to have that. You don't want to have that guarantee. So mm -hmm. the best solution is to just dispose those lithium ion batteries. Um, you only want to, yeah, you want to make sure that no one gets hurt. Um, that's the one answer to that. The second answer is there is not such a large market for, let's say, usually the the purpose of Second Life is energy storages. Let's say you attach it to solar panels or wind turbines um, to uh, um, in the middle ground, save it until you put it into a grid. Um, that's usually where most of the use cases um, are, are situated for Second Life. That market is not that large as you think. Um, so we don't need that many Second Life batteries for that purpose, for instance. Um, so the market need is not even there. Um, and the third one, you can ask yourself, would you rather use a 100% capacity lithium-ion battery for your device or actually have a green heart and uh, use a device that has 80% capacity? So that's another consumer behavior um, answer to that question. Very cool. And um, perhaps just one comment. There is a question in the chat that has been answered by any of you because I, I think you also might not have the, the strongest opinion on that. Whether, uh, but it's a very um, important question overall. Whether the IRA uh, Act, so to say, in the United States, um, will you know where you need everything manufactured in the United States will hurt us. I think for you, most of it they still fix it, they still recycle it, so that's not a problem. Uh, perhaps I can comment from my side. I think. So far, the European Union is reasonably optimistic that, that there will be a, uh, an agreement between the US and, and Europe, at least at some point, but let's see, right? I think it's um, not sure whether, whether any of the panel has something to say, perhaps one of the, <laughs> of the people in the audience has, you know, more of a, you know, even uh, from our MIT guys has an has a insight into um, where the political negotiations stand at this point in time, right? Unless you want to go, I think Sarah, you also had you know some experience in, in economics and so on. I don't know whether you have any opinions on that. <laughs> yeah, this is a very geopolitical uh, question. Um, for the lithium-ion battery uh, case, is um, all the materials to produce a battery do not exist here in Europe. So uh, the European Union is completely dependent on imports. Either it's the raw materials to produce it locally, or mm -hmm. As it is for now, we import all batteries to Europe to put it into our cars. Um, so yeah, I definitely don't see any friction here or European Union does not have the power to have friction here. So I don't see any, uh, I would say in that direction, anything negative. So uh, I think the European Union will be best friends with the US in this regard. Very cool. Now, you know, lots of people ask you questions. Now, I think it's the time to turn it around and to ask for favors from the audience. So what would be the biggest help? You know, some people already offered help that the MIT community, how how can they support you, right? I mean, um, what's what could they do? I mean, let's start with Miriam or so you're back here, so to say, if, if you had a wish <laughs> to our audience and perhaps they can comment then on the wish, what would you like? <laughs> what would I like? Um... Of course, like, um, you know, partnerships or like corporations, like like we're looking definitely for early adopters who already want to go with us the way to net zero and like maybe try it out with like a pilot or something. Uh, we're also working like on a couple of projects about decarbonization of supply chain, 
monitoring management of supply chain from like low tech environment to like, uh, you know, going into retail stores. So along the chain. So this is also really interesting. Um, yeah. So they are also like the network digital trade is coming into place, right? Where you can like cover scope three. Um, so this would be like 100% useful. I would be happy to uh, get emails or you know, LinkedIn. Any wishes from the others? So that's a clear wish. I mean, you. I mean, and if you still want to use your chat, you can, you know, offer offer help. But uh, let's go. Let's go further. Let's give Sebastian a chance. Yeah, I think from my end, um, I think as I mentioned earlier, if you have um, any link to repair or if you know someone in the area uh, running a business, um, that'd be super helpful to to yeah explore any collaboration opportunities. And sometimes those are not those are not so obvious. Like for example, we have recycling companies approaching us now. We'll say actually we understand that this whole reuse is happening more and more and more and we actually also want to um, help accelerate that and they get a lot of materials that can still be repaired but they can't really sell them because they're often declared at waste and things like that so uh, those are super interesting um, yeah investors are always helpful for startups I would say <laughs> that's one thing um, and last but not least I would say if you have uh, yeah if you Living in one of the German cities, um, as for now, Berlin, Munich, um, then we might have an offer for you soon. So stay tuned. Cool. And um, here, Anne Marie, money or customers or both? Cities. Yes, I mean, I can just join the others I, with saying that networking and finding new partners and collaborations is so important also in this uh, context where yeah um it's maybe not that easy to get get started and get into action with direct customers um so any kind of partnership is very much appreciated but also what we are always looking for, because we have this web portal called DKSR Square that we developed. Um, so municipalities can just go there and easily find their way from their individual challenges to database solutions that answer to them. And there we also list um, third party solutions from providers, also commercial providers. So mm -hmm. if there's any cool and innovative database solutions that could play a role and yeah, have impact in the context of um, urban management and urban planning, feel free to contact us because we're just happy to yeah, collaborate and um, put them into good use in Germany and Europe too. Excellent. So not just customers, also partners. So Sarah, you okay. go last. Right? You had an offer for customers. So do you want money too, or do you... <laughs> we want all the batteries that need to be recycled? Okay. <laughs> so if you have any battery waste, please come and reach out. But also on the second hand, if you want to get lithium, nickel, cobalt, manganese, and graphite, we have reservoirs <laughs> that we can um, sell to you. But now, and then thirdly, um, we are actually looking for strategic business angels uh, to join our round. Um, so reach out uh, if you want to be part of the mission of To Zero. Excellent. So th let's thank you know our panel very much. I think you deserve some virtual applause. You know, thanks a lot. I think it was a very lively discussion, um, and 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 great companies. I hope uh, the community you know will embrace it and and also support you. And um, uh, thanks a lot. Um, as I said, you know, uh, if if you can make your presentations available to the host, or give the host a signal whether they can use it. Do that, and I would like to then hand over to Houston or or Boston where. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Philip. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Hopefully you can hear me. So thank you very much, Philip. As always, a pleasure working with you. Had a great time. Hope you too. Also, thank you to Anna Marie, Sebastian, Sarah and Miriam. Yeah, I think it was really good again to see you guys together yeah, in the lively discussion. Really appreciate it. And I'm sure our audience will have a ton of virtual applause for you guys and looking forward to staying in touch and seeing how you progress. Uh, let me close out today's uh, webinar and session with a couple of upcoming um, events. So look out. I mean, you have the links, you have the QR codes for Sarah's ES 
SN network, there's something coming up in Sustainable Food Network. We probably had to do a battery supply chain event in June, so watch out for more details there. Uh, we have a, a other topic with the Club of Rome around planetary risk and resilience in October in Berlin. And as I mentioned already, our smart circular cities uh, part two in November in Munich. I'm expecting a couple of other topics uh, coming along the way, not only sustainability, maybe in cybersecurity, maybe in quantum computing that Philip already mentioned. So stay tuned with us. Thank you for attending. Thank you for your questions. It was really appreciated. I hope you got some value from it. We will let you know if we can get the slide decks from the um, startups. I'm pretty positive for this. And uh, we may then reach out to you and send it to you okay then thank you very much uh, wherever you are have a nice day a nice evening a nice weekend happy friday and hopefully to see you soon bye now